Okay, the next item of business is a statement by Kate Forbes on European structural and investment funds. The Deputy First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement. Therefore, there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on the Deputy First Minister around 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, there were various reports in the media about Scotland's use of European structural and investment funds. These were inaccurate and misleading. My statement today is to clarify the position as it stands now, and I'll make a further statement once the programme has actually closed and the final calculations have been completed and published. As I said last week in the Chamber, neither I nor the Parliament's own information centre recognise the figures that have been quoted. And so let me be clear today about the latest position. The maximum amount allocated to Scotland by the European Commission for European Structural and Investment Fund projects is €783.4 million. Euros. That's around £669 million. It's important to remember that the European Commission allocates and pays funding to member states in euros. We then allocate and spend funding on projects in sterling. Now, 60% of the allocations that the Scottish Government have made have been to local government. The rest were largely to public bodies such as Nature Scott, Skills Development Scotland, who delivered excellent green infrastructure and skills training programmes, respectively. The burden of implementing, delivering and agreeing the projects lies with our partners. At every turn, we have encouraged our partners to spend their allocations of EU funding and to meet the delivery targets. Unfortunately, in some cases, projects did contract. For example, the number of participants on structural funded apprenticeship programmes were impacted by the pandemic in 2020, the final year of the European Social Fund. We have also repeatedly asked all our partners to put forward new projects or to expand their existing ones to maximise our use of the funds. Some proposed projects did not meet the European Commission's strict eligibility criteria. And here it's important to note four things. First of all, the European Commission's requirements are very stringent. They only fit a limited number of projects and they cannot be used for core services. Secondly, because it requires match funding, it hasn't always been easy, especially for the third sector, to complete the projects. And then lastly, because the partners have to commit the funding and then claim a refund from the Scottish Government, it hasn't always been uh, the first uh, source of funding that our partners have opted to use. So any suggestion that the funding could have just been used for any and all public expenditure, as I've heard in the Chamber and may well hear uh, shortly, just isn't accurate. Uh, the funding cannot relieve pressure on day-to-day -day spending caused by austerity. It does not work that way. Many factors will influence the final outturn position, and it's simply misleading to forecast at this point what the final outturn position will be. And I want to set out three of the biggest influential factors when it comes to the final position. Firstly, as I said last week, the totality of eligible spending by partners and the total reimbursements we receive back from the European Commission will not be finalised until the second half of 2025, when all the lengthy accounting and auditing procedures are completed. The same is true for all parts of the UK. Indicative forecasts are not final figures. Each programme differs in purpose, scale and the way it is administered. So comparisons with other parts of the UK are spurious. Secondly, the amount currently committed to projects, which were led across the country by our partners, mostly local authorities, is £545.7 million. That expenditure was all incurred prior to December 2023. These valuable projects, some of which I will describe later, have concluded. The final expenditure claims have been submitted to the government. My officials are currently verifying those claims against the Commission's extremely stringent eligibility rules before making the final payment to our partners. Only once payments have been made can we claim the reimbursement from the European Commission. We will do that in July and in October this year. That process is lengthy. All payments are retrospective. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, the European Commission has recently extended the final date for submitting reimbursement claims, and we intend to make use of that to ensure that absolutely every pound or euro that can be claimed will be claimed. Our final reimbursement will now also include a 
contribution from the European Commission over and above the figures that I have used recently made available by the European Commission to all Member States under the new FAST care scheme towards the cost of housing and supporting Ukrainian refugees to Scotland, which the Scottish Government rightly shouldered. Once those figures are finalised, I will be happy to return to Parliament eh, to set out the details. It is worth noting that previous cycles of this funding occurred on a rolling basis, so we were continuously working with partners to identify projects. The difficulty with this cycle is it is the last one. It is a hard stop. We are missing out on this current cycle, which runs 2021 to 2027, that our European partners are benefiting from to the tune of millions of pounds of euros because we are no longer part of the European Union. Those millions of euros are focused very much on renewables and research and development. There are some other important clarifications I would like to make. Our programme partners for European structural funds have always had access to the funding that they requested, so long as their projects were eligible. We have always paid out claims to our partners that fully meet, met the grant conditions. We did so throughout at our own risk. Remember, this is a retrospective programme. And we have effectively provided millions of pounds of working capital to partners to deliver the projects. More than 240 projects right across Scotland have been supported through European structural investment funding. Projects have helped tackle poverty, including child poverty. 18 local authorities have used the funds to assist vulnerable people, including parents, with financial and debt management advice to ensure they are receiving the benefits they are entitled to and securing housing. Zero Waste Scotland has supported businesses up and down the country with much needed advice and support on how to embed resource efficiency in their processes. For example, not far from here, Stuart Brewing were able to benefit from Zero Waste Scotland's advice thanks to EU funding. Nature Scott's green infrastructure programme has created and enhanced more than 200 hectares of green space in urban areas, including 32 hectares of vacant land brought back into use. In addition, Nature Scots Natural and Cap Cultural Heritage Fund used European structural funds in 13 projects across the Highlands and Islands, promoting its outstanding scenery, wildlife and culture. That includes the redevelopment of award-winning Kilmartin Museum, which reopened its doors last September with expanded exhibition and education space. The Smart Cities project brought together our eight cities to share data and learning how to adapt our cities for the future, whether it is solar-powered bins in Stirling, intelligent street lighting in Aberdeen, or helping to set up the Creative Exchange, a new hub for the arts economy in Perth, that funding has helped to modernise delivery of services to citizens of Scotland. And as the member for Skyle of Faber and Badenoch, I know how crucial the funding has been to the Highlands and Islands. The Rural Veterinary Innovation Centre in Inverness opened uh, this March by Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal is a brand new £12.5 million facility developing new links between science and industry mm -hmm. to help address planetary health challenges and grow the natural economy. Following Brexit, the UK Government promised to deliver replacement funding. Its shared prosperity fund is piecemeal. It does not compensate for the huge damage inflicted on Scotland. I am proud of the vast breadth of Scottish projects and programmes that have been supported through European structural funds, from helping thousands of school children and young people on apprenticeship programmes to achieve their full potential, to electric vehicle charging points and active travel schemes to help reduce carbon emissions in transport. I will be delighted to report to Parliament again in the coming months eh, the final financial outturn figures and outcomes that have been achieved once the programme has formally closed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. The Deputy First Minister will now take questions on issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes, after which we will need to move to the next item of business and encourage members wishing to ask a question who have not already done so to press the request to speak buttons. And I call first Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I am very grateful to the other political parties for supporting my request for a full statement from the Scottish Government about the allocation of EU funds to Scotland, because we are talking about very considerable sums of taxpayers' money, about circumstances that have been shrouded in mystery and complexity for quite some time, and a government whose record on fiscal transparency has obviously attracted regular criticism from independent analysts. So with that in mind, Deputy First Minister, in relation to your statement just now, can we have absolute clarity from you on the following? 
Firstly, you state that the maximum amount allocated to Scotland is around £669 million. SPICE, in its extrapolation of EU data, says that the original amount that was available to Scotland was £801 million. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister if she is 100% confident that her figure of £669 million is correct? And if it is, where is the difference between that and SPICE's £801 million? Secondly, could the Deputy First Minister clarify what sum has already been handed back to the EU because it wasn't spent by the December 2023 deadline as a result of projects failing to meet EU regulations about the disbursement of these funds? And on page two, the Deputy First Minister says that she will return to Parliament to provide the final figures. So can I ask when that will be so that we can enhance the scrutiny for this figure? Deputy First Minister. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I could start with the last question that uh, in light of the um, formalised deadline being at the middle of 2025, if it suits Parliament, I'm more than happy to come back with an interim update, but I imagine Parliament would be more interested in the final outturn figures, and I would propose to do that uh, when uh, the deadline has passed for formal um, uh, 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 reimbursement of uh, the figures. Uh, in terms of the difference between the figures, and this is where it gets slightly complicated because of the euros and the, um, the pounds, so if it's okay with Liz Smith, I'll talk to the euros because that's um, probably uh, more, you know, it's easier to verify, as it were. Um, so uh, I talked about the European Commission's allocation being 783.4 million euros. Now, bear in mind that that is essentially an upper limit. So it's not a, a pot of funding that is given, uh, which we then seek to spend uh, in full. It is an upper limit of funding that we can get reimbursement from. Now, she's right in saying that the original figure was €941 million Euros, uh, prior to 2014. And that, uh, uh, that upper limit allocation has uh, incrementally reduced from the 2014 period for a whole host of reasons, uh, some of them to do with where projects have contracted. So I mentioned the example of apprenticeship programmes where, for example, uh, young people were not able to participate due to COVID. There are other examples where, for example, there were initiatives uh, to deal with uh, poverty uh, and for example, match funding has not been able to be found. So that must be viewed as essentially, um, if you'll forgive the analogy, um, a, a credit card limit that's provided by the European Union, which we cannot go over and above. Our aim is to spend as much of it as possible. Now, in terms of the middle question, what has already been handed back? Uh, again, what I was trying to be clear in my statement uh, I've obviously been clear on the two different upper limits, but what I've been clear with in my statement is that I can't give a final outturn figure just now. Uh, I gave the, the three points. Uh, the first, what has been incurred up to December uh, 23 was £545.7 million. Pounds. But what we are now in the business of doing is, try, is working with the European Commission to claim additional funding over and above that for the fast care scheme for Ukrainian refugees. So it is likely that that figure will be higher. Thank you. I'm going to have to have um, slightly sure. briefer responses, Deputy First Minister. Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. And I appreciate the clarification because, as per the statement, the maximum amount allocated being €783.4 million Euros is simply not the case. The amount allocated, the original budget, was €941 million, Euros, and the SNP government have lost €157.6 million Euros by their own admission, because they told Spice, and I quote, that this is due to Scotland failing to meet the annual expenditure targets. And the system, presiding officer, to disperse the money is designed by this government. There is no justification for blaming local government for failing to spend the money when the system was devised by this government. So can the Deputy First Minister confirm the unclaimed portion of Scotland's funds as of 3rd of June sat at 46.5%? Can she tell us whether any other government in Europe has managed to get itself in such a state? Can she tell us how many times we have been suspended from the scheme? And can she find 
finally confirm that the absolute minimum loss to Scotland's communities due to our government's incompetence is sitting today at €294 million. Euros. Deputy First Minister. Well, there was a, a lot of questions in there, most of them based on uh, a premise that is not accurate and is not backed up by the facts. Uh, in terms of uh, undercommitment and underutilisation, I mentioned the three reasons why partners have not always been able to, to spend the money. The first is that it's retrospective. So this is not our design, this is the European Commission's design, that they must spend and then claim back. It's just the fact. Yeah. Uh, they must spend and then claim back. Partners have not always been able to do that. Secondly, it must be match funded. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Um, and over the last few years, things have been extremely difficult. This has been most acutely difficult for the third sector where they've needed to, to do match funding. Um, and the last one is the complexity of the regulations and the heavy bureaucracy. So at the end of the day, we, can, we have spent often at our own risk to reimburse partners for what they've spent, but then we must claim the reimbursement from the European Commission once that has happened. And we work very hard to ensure that the money that we spend will meet the European Commission's strict eligibility. But it is well known that a lot of those projects struggle at times to meet those eligibility criteria because they must be over and above core services. Um, and I think, Presiding Officer, because you're staring at me, I will uh, bring that to a conclusion. Glad that message is getting across. Um, I now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, EU structural funds eradicated by the travesty that is Brexit make a real difference across the country, helping more people into work and delivering new skills through better training and support. Can the Deputy First Minister give, an ex give any examples of how EU structural funds benefited Scotland in this way? Deputy First Minister. Well, we've been part of these funds for over 40 years, and thousands of people and communities and businesses have benefited. Uh, we have a 40-year track record, and clearly the Scottish Parliament was not established uh, over those full 40 years, but we have a track record of knowing how to operate uh, these schemes uh, and how to distribute uh, these schemes. Uh, and many have benefited from a vast range of projects uh, when it comes to skills and employability uh, and training. Um, that has been delivered through a wide variety variety of Scottish organisations and institutions, local authorities, third sector, skills agencies, universities and colleges have all benefited from funding. And Stuart Macmillan makes a really important point. That funding is no longer available and those institutions can no longer benefit from the current cycle. Brian Whittle to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Well, yeah, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary stated that the European Commission has extended the final dates for claims. So it seemed to me that the Scottish Government's ability to seek reimbursement uh, for unallocated funds seems to be more through luck rather than by design. Surely, Cabinet Secretary, it would have been much more effective to have prepared and submitted claims within the original uh, timetable. Deputy First Minister. We have. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Paul Sweeney. The complexity associated with how EU structural funds are allocated is not commonly understood, particularly match funding delivered through third-party agencies and often overseen by local authorities. There has been complexity with COVID impacts and changed audit processes before final outturn figures can be finalised. Now, we all hope that as much money as possible can be spent, but surely the real loss is of the EU funds themselves. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that any replacement funds from the UK Government will not match the value of EU structural funds, despite claims that they would, and indeed an anticipated shortfall to Scotland of £337 million over the next three years? Deputy First Minister. Well, EU funding has theoretically been replaced by the UK's structural funds. And in the first round of funding, the UK government allocated £212 million to Scotland over a three-year period, when EU funding would have been worth around £549 million over three years. So if we are talking um, in terms of the comparison, I think it's quite clear to see from uh, those two figures uh, what the difference is, uh, and that clearly will have an impact on projects that might have benefited. 
Paul Sweeney to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. If I've heard the Cabinet Secretary correctly, there is a float available for allocation potentially by the end of this month of €136.4 million. Euros. That's 18 days to try and maximise the allocation. An example that might be useful to the Cabinet Secretary is the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow, which I understand has a current funding gap of £7 to £15 million. Pounds, and the very solvency of the theatre company is at risk because the money they currently have will be expended by the end of this month. If it is allocated, it could be spent by the end of the year and get the project back on track. Is that a particular example where we could look at that investigation into that particular project to get it back on track? It is already mobilised, it is already there, could be utilised immediately and it could help maximise utilisation of the funds. Deputy First Minister. I, I, I take on board uh, the members' efforts to, to look at um, initiatives that could be funded. I suppose there's three, I'd still go back to making the three points that I did at the beginning, that in terms of meeting the criteria, it's not our criteria it would have to meet. It is the European Commission's criteria. Uh, secondly, um, it's retrospective. So funding would have to be distributed first initially by a third uh, party, claim reimbursement from the Scottish Government and then claim reimbursement from the European Commission. Uh, and the last point is it would have to be match funded. So uh, those points I would make. But we are currently engaging with the European Commission on, as I said, uh, this additional funding on the, Euro on the, on the Ukrainian uh, refugees, where the Scottish Government has upfront paid for resettling Ukrainian refugees, rightly so, and is currently engaged with retrospective uh, reimbursement from the European Commission. So that's really our focus just now, because the deadlines probably have passed for new projects. John Mason to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. In her statement, the Deputy First Minister uh, mentioned the UK replacement funds for European fundings, which Michelle Thompson asked about the level of. Can I clarify, has the UK Government been in, working in partnership with the Scottish Government in this, and have they focused the funds on the neediest areas? Deputy First Minister. Uh, not to my knowledge. I think the answer on both counts are uh, no and no. Uh, we have benefited from EU structural funding for 40 years on a rolling basis. Our partners are currently benefiting uh, to the tune of uh, millions of euros for renewables and for research and development. Uh, we are not seeing the same uh, impact from any UK uh, levelling up or structural funding. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Building on that same point, uh, amid the complexity, it seems that the one point in all of this that is clear and simple is the value of those European structural funds, both in terms of the amount of money and in terms of the amount of control that Scotland had about how to use it. Does the uh, Deputy First Minister agree that an incoming UK Government next month must be under immediate pressure to ensure that both the level of investment and the level of control for Scotland uh, in its replacement funding is at least as good as it would be if Scotland had got what we voted for and remained in the EU. Deputy First Minister. Oh, absolutely. When I was uh, looking at the detail behind this statement, it was with some incredulity that I realised that our partners, our local government, our third uh, sector and our other partners are currently missing out on millions of pounds of euros of funding that is not being replaced by the UK government and doesn't appear to be replaced under either of the prospective manifestos that are currently being debated in the run-up to the general election. So uh, the member, Patrick Harvey, is absolutely right. Uh, our partners could be benefiting, they're not. And I do wonder at the crocodile tears we see about this initiative, when actually this is the last in a 40-year cycle yeah. of funding. And that, I think, merits a lot more grief. Yeah, yeah. Colette Stevenson to be followed by Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Under the EU's 2014 to 2020 budget, Scotland was allocated up to €941 million Euros in structural funding. Can the Deputy First Minister illustrate what was able to be achieved in Scotland through this EU funding before the Westminster parties decided we should be taken out of Europe? 
Deputy First Minister. Well, strategic skills programmes over the past 17 years include graduate, modern and foundation apprenticeships. They have benefited thousands of Scotland's young people. Since 2007, European structural funds have helped 320,000 people in Scotland to overcome barriers to employment. Extensive funding provided for research and innovation for Scotland's universities, including the Technology and Innovation Centre at Strathclyde University. 360,000 small businesses were provided with support to increase their business competitiveness, resulting in thousands of jobs being created. And the galling thing is, our European partners are still benefiting from those things. Miles Briggs to be followed by uh, Joe Fitzpatrick. Th thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, one of the points in the statement the uh, Deputy First Minister has made is with regards to the Ukrainian uh, uh, refugee support scheme, the Fast, Tra Fast Care Scheme. Now, reports suggest that other e EC, EC has offered um, this money and that it's been taken by countries. It's not been accounted in the way the Deputy First Minister has um, outlined to Parliament. So can she confirm, was this money not taken or was it paid back? And and when will that money be accounted for? I don't think it's quite clear from her statement how that's going to actually be achieved. Deputy First Minister. So that um, funding is allocated on a, and please hear, hear me in what I'm saying, on a by unit basis. So the Scottish Government has, for example, fully met the costs of resettling Ukrainian refugees. So uh, that's a Scottish Government budget line, rightly so. What then happens is that we engage with the European Commission and the European Commission reimburses us on the basis of a, a per-refugee, per-monthly basis, which feels dreadful to put it like that because it's very, it reduces people, but you understand what I'm trying to say. And that's over and above uh, the figure that I'd already provided in terms of the £549 million, uh, which is why I say that we will spend, you know, to, to, the, to the last... Um, pound, if we can, uh, the full uh, allocation underneath the upper limit that has been set for us. And finally, Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Deputy First Minister say a bit more on the cumulative impact of EU funding to my constituents in Dundee and communities across Scotland since the UK's accession in 1973? And what is Scotland now missing out on due to the absence of this funding? Deputy First Minister. Well, in Dundee, like across Scotland since the 1970s, uh, Scotland has received over £5.6 billion of economic investment from the EU. It's quite a remarkable figure. Uh, that, if memory serves me, is, is bigger than our capital programme entirely on an annual basis. And over the 40 years that Scotland has been part of the European funding programmes, thousands of people, communities and businesses in Dundee and elsewhere have benefited from the vast range of projects. We are now missing out on an extensive, these extensive opportunities for collaboration. This is the first cycle uh, since the 1970s that Scotland has not been part of, uh, and that's why it, it is a matter of sorrow. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. That concludes questions on the ministerial statement. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business to allow the front benches to change.